So to start this demonstration, the first thing we have to think about is obviously working from a photograph is going to be a little bit different than working from real life. And with real life, we're going to do a, want to do a lot more squinting of the eyes to see the shapes that we're looking at in the landscape. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is break our landscape down into zones of space that we can paint. And so what I've done with pencil, and I would recommend drawing everything you want to paint. Take some time with drawing. So I'm going to draw the contour of that huge shrub bush off to the left. I'm going to draw its lower contour. I'm going to draw the contour of the mountain. I'm not going to do a lot of drawing in the clouds. I'm going to let myself use the paintbrush and develop those cloud formations with the paintbrush. But I am going to draw the differentiation between the land masses that I see. So that very distant land that's in the fog, way in the distance, it's kind of blue in color. Um, this little sliver right here that's light and then the one below it that's darker that is an area of land that's coming forward. I can even go so far as drawing in the little building that we see. If I really want to get into that level of detail in the artwork then I'm going to want to draw that. I want to draw everything that I want to deal with for detail if I want to do some of the foliage detail and things like that in the foreground. So your pencil is really your guide to setting up your painting. Everything that you want to paint should be drawn and should be drawn in such a way where you can see those contours um, really develop a shape pattern on your composition. So we essentially have turned our entire composition into a puzzle and we're going to put this puzzle together piece by piece. Let's start with the sky. Ideally speaking, we want to work background to foreground. So we want to always try to go far into the distance, and then we want to work toward the foreground. Ideally, that's how we should work. If in the um, sense that you're working, you can skip around a little bit to try to save time. But the reason we try to work background to foreground is because it allows us to work in layers. There's two rules of watercolor in general, we say. If you can work background to foreground, that's great but we always want to remember that we're really working light to dark. So take a section like this, for instance, down here. We are going to want to work first with the lightest colors in that area, and then progressively the darker greens. And the last shape we're going to paint are these really dark shadow greens that occupy that shadow space. The same with the sky. We're going to want to work light to dark. So we're going to start with our lighter tone and we're going to work darker tone into that. So the next step would be to think about each shape and what technique would make the most sense for each shape. So I'm looking at the sky area here as a single shape. It's also a very light shape. So it makes sense to start with the sky because not only is the sky the farthest back, so I'm working background to foreground, but it's also a very light shape in the composition. And so it solves those two purposes of what I'm trying to do technically. I'm trying to work light to dark and background to foreground and the sky happens to be perfect. The other thing about the sky is that it has that wonderful cloud formation, but everything is all soft up there. So there's nothing sharp about any of those cloud shapes. So that really lends itself to working with the wet into wet technique. So let's get our little techniques chart out that we made the other day. And we can see that technique number four, wet into wet, would be the best technique to use for the sky because it's going to offer me the opportunity to put lots of shapes in, but have all those shapes remain soft edged in their entirety. The other thing you'll notice is that I've used tape around the border. The tape is going to mask the border so when I peel the tape it'll have a nice perfect rectangle. So to work wet into wet, we're of course going to take some clean water and we're going to just put it down all over that sky area. And I'm going to bring that clean water down to the shrub bush because I don't want it to really go past that point. But I will allow the water to go past the edge of the far mountain because the far mountain is very blue like the sky. So I don't mind getting some blue into that area. I'm also going to smooth that out with the brush and make sure the water is covering nice and fully. And we're going to then get into 
tilting this at a little bit of an angle. I'm gonna tilt that away from me so the water runs away from the painting. And now I've got this nice layer of water. I can keep that nice and smooth and I can immediately go over to my palette and I can charge up some blue for the sky space because I'm seeing a lot of blue in there. I'm also seeing a little bit of grayness to the blue. So why don't we add just a little bit of burnt sienna or something like it into the blue to gray it down. Anything in the orange family will gray down that blue. And I'm gonna keep that blue wet in the brush and I have my paper wet. So this is wet into wet painting. And I'm going to then start the process of seeing those shapes of clouds. And I'm just gonna kind of tap them in to that wet surface. And I'm gonna allow that paint to bleed and move as it hits the paint paper that's wet. So it's, it's intentionally meant to blur and creating this soft gradations from the areas that I'm touching into the white paper that surrounds those areas. So I'm letting the touch of the brush hit the points of darkness and I'm letting the dispersion carry that color into areas around. So you can get kind of fancy with this if you want. If you want to take your time, remember we can work not only wet into wet, but dry into wet. So we can work with different variations of that. You can see the areas that I've been working versus the areas that are unworked are going to be building up. So I'm, I'm going to darken the cloud through here, this time with less water in my brush. I'm going to darken it in this area. I'm going to darken it further up here. Again, the paper is still wet, so everything I'm doing when I touch this page is dispersing. And you can see that by working with wet into wet, you're able to really achieve that blurry feeling of those kind of clouds moving through the sky on that particular day. It's actually a day a lot like today, a little bit gray. A little bit cloudy, although today we have the pouring rain, so this would have been nothing but a wet into wet painting in the pouring rain. So you can see the wet area of my page, which is in the top, and the boundary of that wet area comes down to here. So if I paint anything and touch that, the paint that I put down will bleed into the wet surface, and it will create a bleed like the sky. So if I was to do this dark bush here and touch that dark paint next to that water, that dark paint will bleed into the sky. That's not really what I'd like. What I'd like is to let that sky set up and dry, and I'd like to move to an area that I can work where it's not going to touch. So I'm going to use this dark shrub, all of the middle landscape, and the dark tree shrub to the right as a boundary, and I'm going to start to lay in my light colors down into the bottom. So this would be a case where I'm working with multiple colors. So I'm gonna get my palette ready and I'm gonna work with a yellow on the left side. And I might bring in a little yellow ochre into that as well, maybe make it a little bit more soft. And I'm also gonna get ready some sap green which is gonna serve as the color for the majority of the block in areas for the rest of that space. And I'm gonna work them together in patches. So I'm gonna start with the yellow and I'm gonna work in this patch here that you can see. So you can see the patch of kind of yellow, I guess like parts of the weeds, the plants of the weeds, they're kind of yellow through there and it works through this space here, kind of across. And you notice I'm letting my brush dance. I'm thinking about the calligraphy of my brush. I'm not trying to make perfect shapes on purpose. I'm trying to feel for the shape that I see in that landscape. I'm gonna go up to the green and I'm gonna start finding that green in its place. And I'm gonna make sure that the green and the yellow don't really touch because they'll bleed together. Instead, I'm going to take that green and I'm going to just block it in through this whole right side. 
I'm gonna let the green and the yellow mix together and I'm gonna continue the block in down through here. And so you notice I'm just getting some undertones down, but in doing these undertones, I'm trying to also establish the basic shape of green to yellow within this landscape. Now there's green underneath the yellow, so I'm gonna to touch that. And I want some of the yellow and the green to bleed together because I like the way that they do that in the image here. They kind of, there's a flare to the way those two colors meet. The whole bottom is really, again, the lightest color, the lightest color from here down is basically green. So I'm gonna block that green in. I see more of a yellow ochre. It's like a little dirt patch right here. So I'm gonna go in and put that yellow ochre in there for the dirt patch. And I'm gonna continue just blocking in the green throughout until I start to get to the point where that whole zone is now filled with color of some sort with a few little white points sticking here and there. So I've blocked in the basic shapes of the whole bottom of that composition. Now, when I look at that, I notice that there's a lot of blur in places. There's a lot of places where the dark patches seem to go in and they don't really go in sharply. They kind of go in with a little bit of a blur. So I'm gonna, while this paper is wet, I'm gonna continue with now a very dark color. I wanna go with Prussian blue, some alizarin crimson, and I wanna make like a dark, blue purple for the shadows and I'm going to add some green into that. So I'm going to a darker point and I'm going to try to find some of these shadow points through here. And as I tap the brush, the brush is quite dry. The brush is very, if I work off to the side, you can see it's quite a dry brush. It doesn't have a lot of water in it. And so my dispersion is going to be much slower. And I'm gonna work with like little taps and marks. I'm thinking about mark making. I'm thinking about all the things we did with pen and ink where we had to mark make our way through the landscape to have this all work. And I'm gonna to start to add some of these darker colors. And as I do this, they're going to disperse and they're gonna create the feeling of dark and light meeting the shadow in that area. As I move over, I'm gonna lighten this up a little bit because it starts to get a little light over here. And so on, you can start to see all this happen. Now that dark green that I've used is gonna be very useful for other areas of the painting. But for right now, I'm still kind of thinking in block in terms. And so I'm not worrying about getting everything perfect. I'm worrying about getting some of these undertones to just lay into place. And I see some places back here where it's gonna be smaller, but a little bit more tone back there as well. And there's some tone of the pathway it looks like. It kind of comes around the side over here. And some of these grasses in the foreground. Now the foreground's gonna to wanna to have the most texture and the most tone. So I'm gonna go over that again. We're gonna really build that up as these layers progress. In the meantime, I'm watching my painting to see how it's drying and I'm seeing if that top section has dried long enough for me to start to go into another layer and it has. It's not perfectly dry, but it's dry enough for me to start to lay in the next layer of mountain. So really all I'm gonna do is take that blue gray and I'm gonna put some water in it and charge it back up and I'm just gonna lay over that mountain in the distance because I've now doubled the layer. I'm not gonna worry about the trees in front because they're darker and they'll cover that up. I only need to worry about that little white house. So if I paint over the white house, that would be a problem. I wanna avoid that. But I'm gonna lay that lighter blue into that distant mountain. And I might wanna make it even more blue. It looks like it's a little more blue than gray. So in that case, I may wanna go back and remix my blue without much burnt sienna to maintain the brightness of it. 
to keep it from getting too gray on me. But regardless of how I do this, I'm looking to try to add that next layer of space. I've now put wet work here. And so the question would be, what can I do next to put down some color that won't touch that? And what I could do is start to put in the shadow shape of this tree over here to the right. So again, back to my shadow colors, Prussian blue, alizarin crimson, a little sap green. I'm getting into that dark blue, green, gray that I'm looking for in the shadow. And I can start working this over here, again, because my paint down below is dried and it allows me to put the shadow in this space. Kind of a little horizontal there. And some of the shadow actually comes up and you can see the texture of the plant. So I'm letting my brush create some of that texture. And again, I can go in there and put that shadow shape in because the paper underneath has dried. But if I touch this blue area there, it will bleed. So I want to stop. As I'm continuing, I'm analyzing my piece. I'm trying to determine where I have wet and dry paper. And at some point, you're going to get the paper to a stage where it's totally wet all over and we need to let it dry. The beauty of transparent watercolor is now that this shadow here has dried, I can mix up a transparent lighter green, like sap green, and I can continue that shrub bush, getting some of the texture of the leaves against the sky with the tiny tip of the brush. And the sky is now dry, so it's given me a chance to do this where these little, if the sky was still wet, those little tiny dots would not stay dots. They would turn into bleeds, and I would lose those little edges and textural gradients. But if I do that, I can work my way down, and as I let the sap green meet that dark green that we put down originally, you now start to see the combination of light and shadow with these two shapes meeting. Okay, in other words, the transparency allows that dark blue-gray to show through. And so we can get an effect like that where we feel some of that little bit of sunlight on the top section of that shrub and then the shadow underneath it as that develops. Now, as we come across, we're going to see places where we want to work further saturation. For instance, I can take my sap green again with probably a little bit more yellow in it this time so it comes to the foreground and I can start working with some feelings of the foreground shrub work or these weeds I guess in the field up against those lighter spaces and I'm working with a doubling layer so the doubled layer becomes more saturated I can go again and I can resaturate this section over here. And again, because I'm doubling it up, it resaturates and creates more saturation. But it also, you'll notice I'm leaving some little gaps of the original green. So there's some lighter spaces as well in there. And it's not all just one color. I don't want to just keep covering everything up. I want to leave some layers in there. I'm going to do the same through this middle space. And again, try to add more texture with the brush and feelings of even individual weed shapes. I'm going to, again, saturate further this whole field off to the right, but leave, again, some light green to the left of that so that it feels like it has some gradient. And I'm going to leave the lightest. The first green is going to stay in the distant background space, so I don't want to disturb that too much. I am going to fully saturate the foreground a little more. So I'm going to go fully saturated with the green as deep as I can. I'm going to come in here and really saturate the foreground, both here and here, to again try to pick out some space and the fact that that starts to come forward. So you can see we're starting to develop a feeling
of something happening in the foreground and we can continue to modify with more layers. We'll pick away a little bit more to try to get that foreground to jump. We're gonna pull out a smaller brush. In the meantime, again, my sky is dry, so I can start to block in the shrub to the right in the distance, but that one's further back. So I don't wanna use the same green. I wanna use a green with more blue in it. So what I will simply do is mix up a blue over here and bring some of the green into it until I get a value that's about right. So it's a definitely blue or green. And I'm gonna use that to block in this distant tree that again should be bluer than the one to the left of it, which is closer to us. This one's further away, even though it's on the same drawing plane. And you can see when I block that one in, it starts to have that basic undertone and interestingly, the same kind of color, that light kind of blue, green, and darker is actually occupying the trees through the center, right through here, but just on a lighter side. So I'm gonna add a little bit more water and actually a little bit more blue. I want this definitely to be on the blue side and more water. And I'm gonna to start to lay in the second layer in that landscape that's not the farthest back hill, but the next one up. And again, the only thing I need to be very careful about is working around my little white house because that has to stay the white of the paper. Otherwise, I can just do this sort of thing and block that in right through there. So we're starting to get a basic blocked in shape through that section. Now it needs to darken. So the nice thing is while that's still wet, I'm gonna go into a dark blue and add some green into it. And I'm just gonna, again, do a double touch. And what it's gonna to start to do is feel like we can find some trees within that space, just with little touches of the brush. And what's nice is I've already wetted that area. So the, the color I'm putting down will not go down into my lighter green. It will stay in that little shape because that's the only shape that's wet. It won't go above it or below it. So I can add some texture right up to that little house. And you notice I'm not putting it on the entire shape. I'm just kind of dabbling here and there In order for that shape to feel like it has a little bit of texture in the distance, which it does in the photograph, you can see a little bit of texture back there, but that texture is um, part of a shape. So the shape was put down wet, and while it stays wet, I'm fiddling with it with some textural gradient to give it a feeling of sitting in that space. Again, because I'm working in a wet shape, I can get the texture to happen by dabbling darker colors into that wet surface, but those darker colors remain stuck within the wet boundaries of that shape. Meanwhile, I look over to the right and I wanna take some of that darker shadow color again, and I wanna come in here and find some of the texture within this shrub, same kind of thing, if I dabble it around its base, it'll shadow up the base, but it won't go further below that because this area is wet and the area below it is dry. Meanwhile, I think I'll just integrate. So I'm gonna, a lot of times, this is what you have to do with a painting at, at this stage. We're gonna start to have all these different colors. Let's take some of this and some of this and just mix it together. And that's going to allow me to come in and knit together some of the textures on this shrub here. Now this has had some time to dry, so all these little dots that I'm putting down are sharper and more visible, whereas the ones into the wet area blur away. So you can see I'm able to come in here and bring some of this tree texture back. I can even take some of this and this and mix it together. So some yellow ochre and some of the Prussian blue 
and make a very saturated paint with a really dry brush, maybe even take the brush and do this with it, where it has this kind of odd sort of mushed shape. And I can come into this foreground and I can start wisping in. And you see it's gonna make a feeling of almost grasses coming out of a dry brush quality. I'm using very saturated paint and a very dry brush. And it allows me to come in and bring some of those like weed like textures into that foreground of the painting. And I can do that over here as well. We talk about this as intermixing of color. Every time you intermix colors, you help to unify the painting together and keep it in this kind of realm of pulling together. Again, with the dry brush, the kind of work that I'm doing really pops and doesn't blend in so much. It sort of sits on the surface and becomes a little bit more graphic, almost drawn mark making. Now this is where I may wanna go in even with a fine, fine brush. This is a very small painting after all, which would afford me even more texture gradients and the ability to build smaller mark making. So what I'll do now is pick up a very fine brush you can see the difference in size of this brush. It's a much finer brush. And this one will allow me again to go to my very saturated mixes and mess around with even if I want to sort of dry brush draw some feeling of the actual weed, textures of the weeds. Again, we did this with pen and ink. We went in there and stippled and brought out all sorts of textures in the foreground that were visible. And if they're visible, they're they're gonna be most visible in the foreground. So we want that foreground to really pop forward of everything else. So the foreground should really have the most textural gradient and contrast. And you can't expect the contrast to just show up in your painting without putting it there. You've gotta go in and put it in with more saturation in the brush. And in terms of the texture, you can't expect it to show up. You're going to have to put it in with the way you work that brush into the piece. Nonetheless, you can start to see we're developing something of interest to this whole foreground where it makes the background feel further away. Now, as this shrub to the right has dried, it's realized it's going to also need a little bit of texture. It's a little mushy. So we're going to come in with some texture and we're going to just work the edge of it and make it pop a little bit. I'm gonna also notice that the building in the distance has a little bit of shape. It has a little bit of a roof shape. It has a window that kind of pops down. So bring that window down now that I have my tiny little brush. And I notice that some of the mid-ground field is going to be needing a little bit of more saturation right now. It's a little bit light through that whole space. This whole section here feels kind of flat. So at this point, I do need to clean an area of my palette with a paper towel and I'll come back with some nice sap green again, this time keeping it thinner. And I'll just start to bring in some layers over that section to darken it up just a little bit. making it more moderate in its tonality. As I look at it at this stage, I'm thinking that mainly what the thing needs is just one more glaze down in the foreground of something to make the foreground jump forward even more. And what we know about color we've mentioned with atmospheric perspective is that as colors go back, they get bluer and bluer and bluer, more like the atmosphere. What that also means is that those colors lose their yellow and red. So the one color missing down through the foreground is a little bit of a sense of red. So if I take some alizarin crimson and maybe even a red oxide, kind of a red brown, I can take those colors and glaze them over these greens to make the greens have a feeling of a little bit of redness in them in the foreground. 
I'm not really wanting red everywhere, just a few little hints of it. And that little extra red just helps the foreground come further forward. Just mixing the green and red together, we get these kind of earthy greens, which will tend to come forward from that background space. And so we start to get to a point where we're gonna to wanna to know when to stop. And what I feel like is I'm looking to try to capture a feeling of the space, almost an impression like the Impressionists. I'm not trying to worry about getting every little detail in the painting. I'm worrying about trying to get a feeling of the place that I'm painting, that weird little slight foggy day and the feeling of the green in the landscape against the, the yellow. Now I'm noticing my yellow has diminished over on the left here. And that's probably the one thing I wanna go back and do. So again, because I'm using a yellow, which is a light color and it would be affected by so many pigments, I'm gonna clean an area of my palette. I'm gonna put some clean water. I'm gonna take some nice clean yellow ochre and I'm gonna glaze it into that area which is gonna make that yellow, I'll use a little brighter yellow actually, let me go to the lemon yellow and let's glaze it back over this space to make that come out more. If we add that yellow on top, it makes that come out of the picture more than it had been. So that's a remedy for pulling back some of that feeling of the yellow that we're missing in that area. And it kind of extends into some of the little foliage off to the right. But again, in somewhere in this moment is where it feels right to stop. It feels like I've captured a nice feeling of the place and that it has a nice satisfaction for being a sketch. It's a sketch after all. If I was making a serious painting of this landscape, I'd for, first of all work much bigger and I would be working in a much more detailed manner than what we might do with a little painted sketch. So at this point, we've come to a resolution. We feel like it's you know, a nice little rendition of what we saw, and it's going to allow us to have a memory of it. So at this point, what we'll do is we will peel, and we can compare them side by side and see how we did in terms of a feeling and an impression of that place. <laughs> 